My name is Marcel Bruce Raymer with Elite Medical Prep. I'm the president and co-founder. And today I have me with uh, Dr. Thomas Smith from the Medical University of South Carolina. And we're going to talk about a recent blog post where we followed up on, on a discussion we had with Dr. Smith. Uh, Dr. Smith, do you want to introduce yourself? I have, as you mentioned, I've, I work at the Medical University of South Carolina, where I direct our Center for Academic Excellence. We've got six medical education learning specialists who assist with all phases of learning across various curricula, but we've been working on step one thing since probably about uh, 1997, um, and I've been at the place since 1999, so we've seen lots of changes. I'm not sure we've seen uh, a moment like the change from scored to pass fail, though. Yeah, that is an interesting. We are in an interesting time. And um, there was a blog post that we put together where we had sort of a, summarizes what we had as far as a discussion on your thoughts on the changes and what you've seen so far. So it's sort of characterized in that way. And I guess the, the thing that would be great for people who are going to be watching this video to get as far as a summary or some insight into that blog post would be uh, to, to sort of address some of the following questions. How would you describe the amount of time that students are spending on step one before prep now currently with the, the pass-fail curriculum versus previously when we were in a scored curriculum? All responses to a question like how are students preparing have to be, be framed with a big caveat that there's always been a range of preparation uh, strategies and amounts across any set, reasonably large set of students. So um, at my institution, we've got roughly 170 varying class to class. So, so of course, there's variation within that. But I expect to find once we get through this cycle that the average amount of time people describe spending during their dedicated periods of study is going to be sort of lower. And when we survey them, I'm expecting to find based on conversations with a huge percentage of them, that the average amount of time people spend before they get to a dedicated period has gone down pretty substantially. Now, I, I think the actual lived experience for those students is that they're working exceedingly hard. And it's, it's certainly hard to know sort of while you're in the thick of it, what, that you might be working an hour less, two hours less than the typical person who's like you in a prior cohort. But I think what's happened is that we've had just sort of slight reductions in investment of time across the board, which end up sort of making the typical advice for how to prepare perhaps a little bit off and the typical ways to measure success as you're preparing a little harder to gauge. Those are great points. Um, and of course, the data is still coming in and we'll see with subsequent years. I guess, so we at, you addressed you know, the amount of time that, that students are spending and that's changed. It looks like it's going down, but I guess there may also be a change in learning styles amongst those who are preparing for step one uh, currently in the, in the past fail versus before. Any, any early observations on, on that front as to like what kind of activities and learning styles they might be using? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that... Um that the approaches to tackling this task, you know, students have adopted them based on advice from people like you, advice from people like me, but mm -hmm. also on lore passed down from prior classes. What I've observed in our cohorts, and I think others across the country have observed too, is that just the pressure on the amount of questions to complete um, has gone down at the mm -hmm. same time that most sources of practice questions continues to go up. Mm -hmm. and, and so in any given sort of set of questions, whether it's from UWorld or AMBOSS or Kaplan or whatever resource somebody's using, the, the number of questions goes up, but the percent of completion of those questions tends to go down. And I think part of that is just the competitive drive, like it's the pressure is not quite there. Um, right. But part of it is people are thinking about what's absolutely necessary to pass, and it can't be as extreme as what I've experienced before. That, I think, also makes people more inclined to use what, I, what you and I think would think of as more passive learning strategies, right. because they don't think maybe the challenge is quite as great, so right. they, they don't need to get as fine grain a test of every concept as maybe they 
would have felt was necessary in the past. Yeah, well, I think that's a great way to, to think about maybe is less sort of pressure and, uh, and so that will maybe change strategies they're going to employ or how much they'll, they'll do that. You know, what would you characterize as the current problem in self-assessment among medical students preparing for step one? And I think this is something that's been a particularly area of interest for you, or at least a major question you, you've been dealing with with your colleagues. And so it, may, it would be great to hear your, your thoughts. This, this is a super complicated question. Assessment of where somebody stands for step one is always a sort of a fraught endeavor. Mm -hmm. and, and in the past, the reason for that has been that the mechanisms we have available to predict somebody's outcome on step one are not precise enough in the predictions they provide and, and sort of reliable enough in the predictions mm -hmm. they provide to give sense people a sense of the actual readiness they've got in relation to say a target three digit score. And so there's never been a way for somebody to be absolutely kind of certain that they're above some threshold based on a practice exam, unless they're scoring way above it already. And unless their threshold then is, is relatively low in relation to the practice exam scores they're getting. That's only true for sort of the, the folks at the very higher end of the score range historically. So what we've got now, though, is we've got a circumstance where people are preparing a little less intensively and they're using sort of uh, assessment measures such as the NBME that have changed to sort of pass fail probability and that have changed to kind of a equated percent correct score, these, these measures, you know, they would provide you the kind of feedback you need if your probability is exceedingly high and your percent correct is exceedingly high. But when, when that's combined with people preparing less, then you've got larger percentages of the cohort who look like they're at risk of not passing, who never would have looked that way before. And so that slight increase in that group is, is challenging. And then there's middle group, which we've found um, is, you know, they're people we would have anticipated to have kind of average or slightly above average, slightly above, below average step one scores. Their scores on a practice exam, like the three digit scored U world self assessments, 20, 25 points lower. And that's a, that feels like an enormous distance to a group of people who've been talking to their senior peers about what's the difference between scoring a 230 on step one and a 205. And mm -hmm. To that group of people, that sounds like an enormous difference in performance and feels like a really crushing blow to students who are getting scores on three digit scored tests that seem like they put them in a group of people at risk. You know, it's difficult to answer and I think you did a great job of handling it. And I guess the question then, the follow-up to that would be, what do you think the NBME or the other services such as UWorld could do to help students and medical education advisors such as yourself you know, to decide on student readiness and comfortability with taking the exam? The answer to this question, you know, goes to what some things that have always been historically true about step one, about the level of, of information that students have access to about what and specificity about what they'll be tested. And that's super hard. You don't want to sort of compromise the validity of a test by sort of getting too into the weeds with that. However, I think that one thing that could be done is, is a more aggressive use of the content blueprint of step one within the framing of every sort of feedback that board review companies give or that um, the NBME gives. And right now, there's not that kind of fine-grained fine -grained effort to take the content blueprint mm -hmm. and really give people useful feedback about the, the lower um, hierarchy parts of it, where right. they truly ha are having difficulty with certain things. You know, that's a hard thing to do, and I, I don't have the answer about precisely how to do it, but the, for example, the NBME self-assessments have always been much better at thinking about the overall outcome than they are at 
discriminating weak strengths and weaknesses along even the system division or the discipline division. And so what we need though, is a way for a student to truly use some, some practice assessments to know what they need to work on, to know what right. they need to learn. MBME may not be able to do it, but I think board review companies would be wise to sort of be thinking along those lines um, as well. And I also think if there's a way for board review companies to think about tiering information and gradations of difficulty as sort of a, a marker for uh, high probability test items. And I know that they can't be perfect with that, but there are some sort of sets of question banks that have, that have tiers of difficulty that I think at least provide a way to go into a question bank without at one moment getting a question that 70% of people get right and the very next moment I get a question that 40% of people get right. And it's probably, generally speaking, true that it's more important for me to first know that I'm, I'm getting those questions right, that high percentages of people are getting right. Right, right, totally. This is another complicated issue that's evolving. So great to have you on and have this discussion. Obviously, there's a lot more to discuss here. Some of this has been covered in greater detail in a blog post, again, that I mentioned. It's called Observations and Trends After the Switch to the USMLE Step 1 Pass-Fail, What the Learning Specialists Are Saying. Uh, and it's based on an earlier discussions with Dr. Smith. This discussion today obviously covered some additional facets of that discussion, and this is going to be ongoing. We'll be writing more about this. I want to thank you for joining us today, Dr. Smith. Please check out the link. We'll attach it to this video and look out for more, uh, more articles that will be on this topic. Uh, hopefully we'll get we'll be able to meet with you again and discuss some more topics on this. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you.